Hello everybody, uh, I'm Sarah Trail, some of you know me, some of you don't. I have recently just completed my research with this one of my fabulous successors over here. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about it today. So I've been researching um, making sense of the feedback experience as the title and it's an interpretive phenomenological study that explores the lived experience of mental health student nurses who've received feedback on their written work. So I was very curious, oops, wrong way around. I've been very curious about feedback for some time, been a lecturer for a long time, and for a while I had to deal with complaints from students who were upset about the feedback they'd received. Um, and sometimes when I looked at that, they'd actually received good feedback, sometimes they hadn't, but sometimes they'd received good feedback, but it seemed to really hit a nerve and activate something in them. And there were other experiences I've had where I'd informative settings said, how do you like the feedback? And they would invariably give me different ways that they would like their feedback to be given. Uh, they engaged with it in different ways. So I thought, slightly worried about the direction of travel in the current academic climate where things are formulaic and quite standardized and had some concerns about that. So in exploring the literature, I found that feedback is one of the most powerful things within learning. It's one of the most important things that can be done to help people develop and move on. However, within the literature, it really focused on models, approaches, evaluation. Feedback was very much seen as a product that was provided for people. Um, issues such as people's fundamental engagement with feedback, their interaction with it, and more psychical experiential approach just hadn't been properly conceptualized. And I also thought, well, people are writing great feedback sometimes. You know, they're writing great feedback. It has the power to do something really good. But that doesn't mean that it will. It will work. If there's something missing in that space. So I was really keen to explore that. And so I started a research project that looked at exploring how students made sense of those feedback experiences and I particularly looked at written feedback because there was less opportunity for it to be influenced by things like in-person relationship, tone of voice, etc. And it's also the most common way that students get feedback post summative assessment and in written form. Um, and so that was, that's what I did. So the research question was, how do students who've received written feedback on their written academic work make sense of their experience of receiving feedback? And the methodology I used was, um, I, I used interpretive phenomenological analysis as a methodology and a method, but it was slightly adapted. So I found this approach to be a good framework for capturing lived experience. It was also underpinned, underpinned by three other elements as well. So it was quite influenced by Heideggerian hermeneutic phenomenology, <coughs> and also Gadamerian human hermeneutics, and critical realism, Pascal's critical realism, which is all around what something looks like, is there many things going on underneath that produce what, what you see. So I was very keen to take an ideographic approach to, so to understand each case in depth, um, and then also to look at group themes and what is going on for a lot of students. The other aspect I was keen to do was have a dialogue with wider theories. So my approach to knowledge construction was really about what the students were saying, the sense they made of it, my sense of their sense making, uh, coupled with what's written and marrying it all together to create something new. I did, however, have a real preference for a framework, and I'm quite pragmatic, so IPA really spoke to that part of me that wanted to follow a, a process. Uh, the method of IPA and the method approach that I used was I interviewed second year mental health nursing students, I interviewed seven. Um, they were students who'd had feedback in year one and in year two, but weren't in at the end of the course because the research I'd looked at showed me that students at the end of a program were much more confident. It was um, I was less likely to get the, the information that I needed if I looked if I looked at them. 
they were all over 21, so they were all considered mature students under the um, criteria that we have in the UK. And I used individual semi-structured interviews with each. These were recorded and transcribed, and then I analysed each case by case, developing personal experiential themes, and then looking at group experiential themes. I took lots of photos, there was a really sort of clear audit trail and um, a lot of discussions with my supervisory team, but I kept a reflexive journal throughout, which was really, really important. I think it's probably best captured by this image here, which shows a kind of sequence of photos that show the research journey. So my uh, reflexive journal had prompting questions for when I was looking at the material uh, to make sure that the way that I engaged with the material was analytical, uh, sense-making rather than descriptive. Um, I would also keep that with me all the time, so when I had any moments of uh, ideas, wherever I was, whoever I was speaking to, anything that spoke to me, inspired me, I would record in that. The transcribing process, or the analysing process for each case in IPA is quite interesting because you have the um, transcription, but you also have a section where you uh, make initial notes about what you're observing, what sense you're making of it. I also added a column to help me dump any conceptual things or any ideas that might be influenced by my previous training or educational experience. I could make sure I was foregrounding those and being aware of them. But equally, once you've gone through each line, looking at it, analysing each line, you then summarise sections to look at what does this passage tell me about this particular sense this person made of that particular experience. Once you've done that, you then list all those experiential statements, chop them up, put them on a surface, and start moving them around and clustering them, looking for points of connection, points of divergence, until you end up with personal experiential themes. That's then a table, which is there, turned into a table, where you can show where it was in the transcript, etc. And I did that for every case. Once I'd done that, I then put a summary document together, which is this one here, so it could be captured in my mind when I moved on to the next stage, which is looking at each case and grouping them in, in groups. So anyone doing IPA, I would definitely advocate for colour coding your documents so you can move things around and keep track of them and then photograph them at each stage. And then you develop something which is called a uh, table of group experiential themes. So lots of different students' accounts and the sense they made were themed and I ended up with uh, a number of themes, which are two main themes and some sub-themes. So I'm going to show you what I found. The first theme I've called educational baggage. And so in this, I was describing the referential totality of a student taking themselves into an education system, being assessed, being engaging with it, all that that involves, and that that really influences the sense a student makes of the experience that they have. Their history, their hopes for the future, their sense of themselves as an individual are all happening in that moment when they read the written feedback that they get. So that's why people don't like the like same way, because they've got different types of educational baggage that they bring with them that's going to influence it. Within this, I had some sub-themes. So for some students, they were really looking for external uh, status and recognition through that process. For other students, they didn't have any idea about the potential of feedback, how to use it, they may not engage with it. Some students had real issues with their confidence, which influenced that anticipatory phase before they received information and really influenced their engagement with it. We also had a number of students who were carrying with them the legacy of quite negative school experiences and so when they got feedback, it was triggering things from the past for them. And moreover, we had variations in the ways that students could regulate their anxiety or nervousness um, uh, in those situations. So there was a fair amount of procrastination, there was a fair amount of perfectionism, there was a fair amount of rumination, all of which are sort of strategies for coping. 
The second key area that I found was the mediating influence of the relationships. So the way that people responded could be influenced by their connection with the organisation and the system and the capacity um, for that system to see them as an individual and to understand what they needed and, and to work with that. So I found some really interesting things within this area. I'm not sure I would find it now, but at the time, um, one of the things that cropped up was empathy for the marker. So students would say things like, well, I didn't get the feedback I needed or I wanted, but you know, they've got 50 scripts on the mark, what are they gonna do? So they were sort of making sense of it through the eyes of the marker and they would accept level down um, standards for that reason. The other thing that came across quite strongly and was a sense of respectful communication, respecting the effort, and also respect for someone's history and experience prior to, the, to what they were doing. So one typical quote was, I don't expect to be spoken to like a child. I'm a 40-year-old woman and I've had a previous career. And that feedback really, you know, that, that triggered things for me. The other thing that um, cropped up was the person-centeredness of the feedback. So could the feedback accommodate them as an individual and their baggage? Could it accommodate uh, what they needed? Was it delivered in a way that was helpful? Um, did the system, the university system, facilitate that sense of being a holistic individual with lots of needs? Could it do that? Was it fit for purpose, if you like? As a result of those things, I uh, came up with a few areas which I think are probably uh, original contributions. And the first one is the ontological significance of feedback, so that it's steeped in ontological significance. Your identity, your past, your future is really influencing the feedback experience and we don't do anything that sort of captures that. The other thing was around the conceptual clarity of these two themes. And the third one was a slightly different way of, of doing IPA and, and using IPA as an approach. There are some implications for practice, really, I think, as academics and um, lecturers. The first thing is, we're never going to really get to grips with what everybody's individual educational baggage is, but we can develop strategies, strategies and approaches to working that help students understand their own educational baggage at the beginning of a program. You know, what are the kind of things, what's your experience of feedback before? What are your potential hotspots? What might be an issue for you? What's your current level of feedback literacy? We can do stuff to help students with that at the beginning of a program. The other thing we can do is uh, incorporate feedback practices that have a relational component however that might be. So it might be that in the first year we look at, you know, you might get your mark, but relate, but feedback might be relational feed forward. It might be a conversation with a personal tutor, for instance. But whatever we do, if we don't look at the relational component and we don't consider students as individuals that have their own histories that might be influencing how they interact with the feedback we give, we're not going to be able to help students fulfill their potential in their learning experiences. So that's, that's my research. I'm very happy to take any questions. I've got a I've seen this research grow and it's been so lovely and then um, to, to, to watch the journey of it as it's unfolded. But there's something you said at the beginning of this that really made me think, I mean, I've listened to this a few times and it's never really occurred to me that the process in IPA of you determining your foregrounding around your own experience is that you yourself as a student, for example, but you're also a marker. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just would like to hear a little bit more about that. I don't know if even if many people here just that in the process of foregrounding, but um, which also, because you used IPA, of course you didn't do the bracketing, which, which is supposed to sort of pack that away, isn't it? Really? Yeah, I, I was very much of the view that I couldn't no, no. bracket. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I think 
in terms of process, I, I tended to, the subjects that were involved in, the people I interviewed, I didn't teach or mark. So that was another reason why I did year two. So they'd not met me in that capacity. However, more so a student, I get marked and I do marking. So there is some, there was quite a lot of reflection around, around that. Um, and equally, what it brought up for me and what it brought up about my own educational baggage that might have influenced my reason for wanting to do this in the first place, which I wasn't really aware of until I got partway through and did that kind of foregrounding activity. Um, but yeah, I'll hold some train of thought. Next. Um, yeah, I think that's a um, can I just ask, how did that change the way you gave feedback to your students now? I, I don't tend to mark or give feedback now, but I really am getting quite involved in curriculum design and development and trying to influence those sorts of approaches. But I've, I made a few recommendations, and the first thing is, the first part of any programme should incorporate that aspect where we help people learn how to use feedback and what it is. But in some ways, I think feedback and marks need to be separate. So um, feedback's about development, marks are about rewarding what you've done, but it's, that's not the way it is. Um, so the way that it's influenced my approach is to really advocate for strong relationships with students as part of the educational journey and a real understanding of them as individuals and to foster their understanding of themselves in the <coughs> educational context. And anything we do practically or any system we develop should have those principles in mind. Um, I've always been a fan of trying to marry up feedback with the person. I've, my experience is that that's just a really helpful thing to do. So I would say I discourage colleagues from being formulaic and systematic and not considering the individual and argue against processes that advocate that. Sorry, just to be nitty, but, isn't it, but isn't that really quite complicated to, to mark on an individual basis when the papers are anonymised? Very much so. So the other thing that I think we need to look at is if marking and feedback have different purposes. So whilst marking, I think there's a reasonable argument for that being anonymous. I don't think feedback can be given anonymously, effectively, because you don't know what's going to be most beneficial. So it might be, I mean it's a big thing, but in future those two things are separate or there's some way of, um, certainly in the early part of the programme, providing relational feed forward that goes alongside that, that helps people make sense of it. And as a very basic minimum there should be the opportunity to discuss the feedback that's been received you know to help people understand it and some sort of ongoing monitoring how that is engaged with and used and, and works i mean the, the stats around <coughs> use of feedback is pretty low and even it's about 17 percent if you can get your mark without reading the feedback most do that mm. if you've got to have both together i'm sure people will look at it but you don't know whether they're really able to use it and with the research that there is about how powerful feedback is as a, as a tool for learning, oh, it's a massive waste. And a massive waste of resources as well. People spend ages writing feedback that never gets to them. Okay, so I'm thinking about the hands that come up already. So just previously, Jim's hand went up, then Michael's, then Simon's, and then over here I saw Keith. So can we do it in that order? Mine well, was answered. I think the second part oh, of the question is was exactly what I was doing. Okay, so if we go, Jim, Michael, Keith, does everybody else have their hands up just then? Oh, I can okay. always save mine. <laughs> 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 Jim? Uh, I, I can answer your question to some degree. Perhaps I'm about to say I'm not sure I'm the thesis two or three times. The, um, the influence that um, that has had on me and the work that I do with, with staff who are marking is to talk about how the same feedback can fall differently on different shoulders. So if somebody does have a, a sort of a reciprocal role of procedure, you know, around criticism, the same piece of, and somebody else if it doesn't, the same piece of feedback will fall on the person's shoulders who are who's, who's less susceptible to criticism. And they'll go, oh, that's interesting, thank you. 
I, I'm the person who's sort of got a bit of a hair trigger for criticism. You know, yeah. Thank you. You know, I want to. The key that my answer to people is to is to say, look, you know, you do need to construct your feedback meaningfully. So it, it, it's like a, a proper dialogue with it, with somebody to say, look, you know, thank you for. It could be appreciated, but actually. Generally speaking, people put quite a lot of effort into constructing an assignment or a piece of work. So, you know, to sort of, to be like it, to be human in feedback is, for me, was the thing I really took from it. You know, that because if you're human with your feedback and it has that relational element, then whatever your reciprocal role procedure is, it should sit reasonably, not neutrally, but it should sit with a less pejorative, you know, not jetting you back to childhood to kind of feedback there, you know. But it's, it's, about, it's how you construct that narrative, isn't it? Always, you know, we know some people they construct a narrative that can be overly critical without, and, but actually sometimes you need to give it uh, um, criticism with a bit of padding, a bit of, um, you know. I was just going to say, some people respond really well to direct give it to them straight feedback. You know, mm -hmm. that can be motivating and mobilising for some and totally detrimental for others, and you're never going to know if it's anonymous. Um, but how do you know that? So I think that's the, that's the key thing. Yeah, I, th I think mine was more of a statement than anything else, but I think it touched upon some of the stuff that you said, Jim. There's something around, I think the area now of social pedagogy is something that's rising, isn't it? It's emerging as, as, um, as yeah. something that is really important when we're working with students, having that social relationship with them, that relational way of working. And your uh, research and talk about that mediating influence in terms of like, those relationships. Um, I found it quite interesting when you talk about this, the, the quotation where the student had empathy for the marker where they said, oh yeah, we've got 50 scripts. So how, I'd be interested as a marker myself, and this is less to do with the actual, um, I suppose, the methodology. I'd be interested myself in how do we get around that? How do we develop that relationship with our students? Or is that something that's sort of ongoing and still? And in terms of recommendations from the research, is there anything that we can do? There's some, there's some other research that has looked at the influence of relational feed forward being particularly important in the first year and that bridging bit from uh, coming in to education. I think that is a recommendation. I think that's a good recommendation. That might need to be via a personal tutoring okay. system. I mean, that's one, that's one way of maybe looking at it. But in some ways, I'm less bothered about the actual, OK, so this means you do this. I'm more bothered about these are the principles to think about, m marry that up with what you're doing, and work out the way that works best for that course with those students in that environment. And I think if it, I, I sort of want to move away from prescription room really, because I think that is partly a problem we've got at the moment, particularly fueled by things like NSS and um, those sorts of aspects, which say things like, um, did you get your feedback? There, the evaluations, did you get your feedback on time? And was it helpful? There's no sort of discussion about engagement, use, of, um, the students' sort of participation in that process. So. Um, the NSS is, is, is a non-relational feedback. It is, yeah. No, the questions ask non-relational yeah. feedback Absolutely. questions that you get. So there's some stuff done with academics who say, well, I kind of play the game in my feedback. I give loans because I'm demonstrating value for money. Mm -hmm. Or I'm writing in a defensible way. But that's the antithesis of learning mm -hmm. and helping people learn. So I think the things we can do to get closer connections with the students that were we're supporting would be things I would advocate for, but how that happens and what shape that is, I think would very much depend on where, who, what course it is. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd be inclined not to be prescriptively. But I think that's really important, so yeah, a piece of research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've got time to sign in. Oh, and Alan as well. But, but we have to do it in order. Well, I've got a real question. It's <laughs> <laughs> always just popped into my head just because of some of the things I've been listening to at the moment about AI. I know we've got all this new GPT and all this new technology, Google, 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 Google. Uh, Do you think that's going to play a role in terms of maybe um, uh, uh, lecturers writing feedback however they would write feedback anonymously? But then you could some do other AI platform feed. It might as well be AI give it back <laughs> to an individual in a way that's more conducive to them, but maybe aware of their educational baggage. 
What AI writing feedback? In no, we write the feedback. No, we, yeah. AI you know, gives it or rewrites it in a way that's. I don't think AI could, and because um, AI doesn't care. <laughs> if, you, if you need to give good feedback, you need to care. And I think that's the bit that we do as well, is we demonstrate care, and in a way that helps students learn beyond the learning episode. And I think that's an essential component of what we do as educators. Okay, just really quickly then. Oh, Keith. Keith? Yep. Adam and then... Nikki, it was just in relation to sorry, what this. Oh no, no, no. Sorry. Surely, uh, educational psychologists would be interested in this work. And I was thinking about biases and unconscious biases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh great! I love the short ones. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of more around the interview. It sounds good too. Interviews that you took to place. Yeah. I was just wondering, was there a link to some, the way that we break news <laughs> around grades and feedback? Is you look at your score first of all. So if I've got a 30%, was there, was there a, a correlation between I've received the bad news because I've got the 30% and the way that they interpret the, the tone of the feedback that's written? Yeah. There will have been, and there's some students on that, right. um, that actually the <coughs> score can interfere with the reading and processing yeah, of the feedback, which is another reason why it needs to be relational, yeah. because you need that connection with someone to help them through through that, but it, it definitely does, and there's an increase in, there can be an increase in defensive, defensiveness, it can be hard to see the material in it that's helpful, yeah. because you feel so confronted, for example, so... Yeah. So, so then the next bit of that is do you potentially as a solution to that offering audio feedback because it offers yeah. a, a caring, compassionate way of breaking that news. There's, there's, yeah, audio feedback. What I've recommended is multimodal feedback. So, because some people don't like audio, mm -hmm. but the groups that seem to benefit best are students that might not necessarily be scoring super high grades um, and students with specific learning needs. Audio feedback seems to benefit them more. Sometimes the feedback practices that we, we use just help students that work hard and don't have emotion regulation difficulties and are super motiv motivated do better, but leave behind, giving more leaves behind people that need, that need a different approach. So, Video, audio, written, arrange, and then people can get some of what they want. Okay, we've got time for you. Yeah, I just want to mention what you're saying about AI. It's um, Queen's University in Belfast just done a study, um, pretty much doing what you've just said. Um, so the lecturers kind of give a brief feedback, they put it through generative AI, and basically said, can you make this sound nicer and more enthusiastic? <laughs> um, and then, I mean, I'm just reporting on what they they yeah. said. But w when they've um, stood at the gone back to the students, they've, they've found that they've liked that. They liked it. Yeah. So that's probably going to work for most, but it's not going to be right for all. Because some students like, give it to me straight. Don't give me any flim flam. I just want to know what it is. Tell me what I need to do. And in those cases, they won't <coughs> benefit from that. So if you've got any one size, it's not going to fit all of it. I think the problem with the audio at the moment is you can only give three minutes, which I thought sounded like a long time until I tried to do it and then kept running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wishing I needed another like this. It's, it's sort of a waste to give loads of feedback after someone's written a summative assessment and then mm -hmm. It's a waste that we spend loads of time doing it. It's not Okay, so we've now got challenges for century because we've got to have mixed and new quiz. <laughs> I, well, I, I'm not expecting an answer to this. It's a sort of semi frivolous <laughs> observation, but it has got some seriousness to it. But is one of the logical consequences of what you presented and other observations around things like social pedagogy or critical pedagogy and everything that we shouldn't just decouple feedback from marks? We should forget about marks altogether <coughs> and do a completely relational learning experience. And work out whether that produces better nurses than, than we wanted to go. Um, so that's just something to put into the room. I'm not really looking for an answer. Thank you so much, Thank you so much for grading me out.